Because people are always, but how do you get the writing into the game? Like, how do you get it in there? And it's like, not that hard. It's, it's kind of, you know. Hello, everyone. In this episode of the FICA Sessions, we sit down with lead writer Anna McGill to learn all we can about writing in video games. <laughs> See, well, I've been working on my awkwardness. I mean, this played around for our social media team. Yeah, so I they could do. A, I good job. I yeah, know, I think you've know, mastered it. I think so too. M- master of awkwardness. Yes. yes. Welcome. Good <laughs> to have you here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you brought fika though. I That's did. the most important question. What fika did you bring? So what I brought, thanks to Twitter, is a uh, Lucicata. Mm-hmm. Um, which is Lucifer cats. And my understanding is that this is a very traditional Swedish role that you have around this time of year. It's made with mm-hmm. saffron. And are those currants or raisins? I don't know. Those are raisins. Okay. Generally. Okay. Well, they're raisins. Um, and they're supposed to be very delicious. And we have two kinds here, one from the equivalent of like a corner store and one from Pretty a much. really swanky bakery. So um, we're going to do a taste test at the end and see which one. I yeah. love how you call them Lucifer cats. I don't have the heart <laughs> uh-huh. to correct you on that. Um, well, according to Wikipedia, um, which is a very reliable source. It's better than Twitter. Uh, if Twitter quotes Wikipedia, is it <laughs> is it not the same? <laughs> where, where does I the truth begin and truth yeah, end? It's just an endless, bottomless well there. Um, but according to my sources, um, which are Wikipedia and Twitter, uh, it's it's St. Lucia? Yeah. Lucia? Sancta Lucia. Santa Lucia. Um, but before that, before it was named for her, it was Lucifer. So It was. Yes. If you take the history all the way back. So here we go. Yes, maybe the Swedes don't know their own history. We don't know the satanic <laughs> maybe you've lost origins of, of this. Yes, you eat these in all innocence. Um, perhaps you will eat one and be transformed. Even though we are here for the fika, technically. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're it's also all, here to That's why I'm here. This. Yes. Yeah, you can just sit there. And yeah. I can talk about writing in games, but it's going to get super weird. Well, I'm curious to hear what you think writing in games is about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this turnaround. I was not prepared for this. It's not in my yes. notes. <laughs> well, there's more twists and turns to come, <laughs> kiddos. <laughs> um, but let's start out with you. Let's turn this back to you. You didn't even answer my question. You didn't even pretend to dignify that with a response. No, because yeah. I, I don't have a good response. You're the expert. I, I so I'm going to rely on you. I just asked what you thought it was. That's all. No, because actually, like, yes. again, like two months ago, I actually sent you, a, I think, a Skype message asking you about this very question. You got me a lot of good answers. Uh-huh. But now I want you to tell the cameras instead. Okay, so um, what is writing in games? Is that the question? (laughs) No, let's start with what you do. You're lead writer here at Massive Entertainment. I am. I am lead writer here at Massive Entertainment. What does being a lead writer mean? Um, It is different at every studio. Um, It really depends on what the project is, what the team is, sort of what the the goals of the game are. Um, But I think the best way to describe it is I sort of wrangle the writing team. um, And I keep them on target for the the story vision of the game. Um, And make sure that the quality of their writing is what I expect. Cracks invisible whip. Um, And and that the characters are well-developed and it it reads well. And it's meeting the needs of this interactive medium, which I think is always the the hardest part. Yeah. And we're going to get... Back to that interactive part, because okay. that's a really, it feels mm-hmm. like a really complicated part. But mm-hmm. just to, to look at you, how did you get started writing? Because mm-hmm. I, I guess we have a lot of budding writers out there in general. How did you get started? Um, well, I went, I went back to school to become a game writer. Um, I was playing video games like most people are, and I had sort of always, I was a bartender at the time. And I was playing video games, and the game had really bad dialogue. I'm not going to call any game out, but it was a long time ago. It's an old game, and the writing was really bad. And I ha- I remember the actual thought. I thought, I could write better crap than this. And then, like, the, the light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, I could write better crap than this. That's such a good motivator. Right? <laughs> you know? And I just thought, I, it couldn't be worse, right? I mean, I could at least write something this terrible. And I think that that right there. <laughs> just such a great, great fairy tale. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's such a happy ending, though, right? <laughs> it does. But yeah, I mean, I think because it wasn't an intimidating goal, I, I thought this is something that I could actually do. And I, I sort of choose my jobs with this, is this something I could stand to do for the rest of my life criteria? And, and I had gotten into bartending for that reason because it looked like fun. But I, the fun was starting to wear off and I was looking at it the future. And this just seemed like something that would be really interesting to me. I was a big reader. Um, I hadn't done much sort of public writing at that point. I'd done a lot of creative writing on my own and journals and stuff like that. Um, so I went back to school and I went to a really traditional college, liberal arts college in uh, New England. And I studied um, English literature and language. And I minored in computer science. I sort of cobbled together my own game writing program. Um, and then I started working as a QA tester while I was in school. Um, right. So when I graduated, I was actually QA lead of a small company. And uh, I just kept saying, hey, I could write stuff for you when I was in QA. And they started letting me do it. And I just slowly got handed more and more work to do. And eventually I became a writer. Yep. Yep. So just, <clears throat> just uh, to look at your, your mm -hmm. background, where have you been before coming to Massa? Like how did you? Oh. How did you end up in Sweden? If nothing else. How did I end up in, in Sweden? In Malmo, of all places. By plane. Um, end of story. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Time for feedback. Bye. Yeah. And cut. Um, so all the places that I've worked before this, um, I've been in games for 15 years, which means that I have moved around and worked at a lot of places. I got my start um, at a very small studio in Massachusetts, in the United States, called Cyberlore. Um, Brenda Romero was the oh, lead designer oh. um, on Playboy the Mansion. Uh, that was the very first game I ever worked on. Um, it was a good learning experience, though. I mean, she's a very thoughtful designer, and so yeah. I, I learned a lot by by watching her. Um, and I worked on that while I was in school. Um, I worked for a, a subcon subcontractor for Hasbro, um, and that's the company I was working for when I graduated. Um, and that was a little less pest shop and uh, this uh, MMO for tweens uh, called Planet Casmo. Kids are rotten. I'll just throw that in they, there. Kids horrible, are really horrible, little, tiny people, rotten. Like George. Um, yes. He's like, quite short. <laughs> you are, though. Well, no wonder you feel, what is it, irrelevant? <laughs> I feel sad for you. He's crying now. Look what you've no, done. He's happy. Yeah. We we <laughs> happy tears. We love yours. Anyway. Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, so after that, I picked up and I moved all the way across the country to Seattle. Um, I had no prospects, no job, nothing. Just moved because that was one of the big game centers and the weather looked more my speed than, let's say, Los Angeles um, or Texas, which are some of the other centers. Um, and I got a job working at Nintendo in their lot check department. Um, and I worked there for a little while um, before I got a job at ArenaNet. And I was a QA editor there, which I think is called a narrative editor at most other places, giving feedback on the story and doing some copy editing and stuff like that, and did some QA work as well. And then started working on the, the writing team for Guild Wars 2. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying to think where I went after that. I worked on a Square Enix project called Murdered Soul Suspect after that. Took a short trip up to uh, Quebec to work on what eventually became Assassin's Creed Syndicate. And I worked on that for a very short time. Um, then I went back to D.C., and I did a whole bunch of small projects on my own. I did some really fun stuff while I was in D.C., unrelated to games, but uh, I'll skip over that because that's <laughs> just a stepping stone on my path to Sweden. Um, but while I was there, I also started um, as a contractor working for uh, Arcane Studios on their last Dishonored game. Mm -hmm. um, and while I was working on that, uh, Remedy came knocking, and they pitched this game to me. And as soon as I saw that game pitch, I knew I had to work on that game. It was like the game that I had been waiting for. And uh, it was just released recently. It's called Control. And so I went to Remedy and, and started there first as their senior writer and then as their narrative lead on mm -hmm. that project. Um, and when I wrapped that up, I came here to lovely Sweden, um, to Malmo, and now I am the lead writer. Yeah. I mean, we, we could do a whole episode on Control, but we're not going to do that. No, we're not. No. I think there's there's plenty of press out there about Control right now that people can look at if they yeah. are interested. Um, I love that game, by the way. Oh, thank you. It's really good. I loved it, too. Good. Yeah. Awesome. I have an occult library um, that I've sort of built up over the years. <laughs> it was the first time I ever actually got to put it to good use. So, yep. yeah, that was pretty exciting. Oh, 
yeah, trying to explain to my brother why I was throwing out Shakespeare, but packing up the occult stuff to move across. <laughs> yeah, fun times. So what is a, because you mentioned mm -hmm. the interactive medium, and this mm -hmm. is where it starts to get tricky, because uh, it's one thing to write, say, because one of the tips you gave me mm -hmm. when I asked, mm -hmm. uh, and I sent you that, that message was, of course, practice writing, just write, 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 right. et cetera. And mm -hmm. then, like, learn how to write a good screenplay was one of the yeah. things you, mm -hmm. you said. But a screenplay is fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's linear, uh, yeah. yes. While a gaming experience, even if the gameplay or the, mm -hmm. the story itself might be linear, of course, the interactions in between right. aren't. So how do, you, how do you plan for all of that when writing a game that you know gamers are going to break? the minute uh -huh. they get their hands on it. Um, of course, you have to expect that. I mean, I think it depends on what your game is trying to do. Like, some games are fairly linear experiences, and you could probably write them as a screenplay. Uh, Control is a screenplay, for example, um, even though you can do things somewhat out of order. Um, once you get to a certain point, things do happen in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. So, And a lot of games are like that. You know, there are... It's almost like a, a flower. It branches out, um, and there's all these petals or whatever they are, and then it comes back. I guess it would be the stem, so they'd be leaves. So let's let's look at this example that we have right here. So it's like you have the stem, which is sort of the main spine of the story, and then it branches out into these leaves, and then it comes back together into the stem again, and then it branches out and comes back. And so there's almost like these checkpoints right. along the way where you can make sure that people have the information that they need to have to progress to the next stage of the story. That's sort of the classic way of, of designing a narrative, and I think that you find that a lot in AAA. Yeah. Um, very rarely do you find a game where you can really just do anything in any order and there's no checkpoints. Because um, it's really hard to tell a story that way. Because basically, you can't build up any kind of drama because they could conceivably find the end first. Right. So, yeah. But how do you practically do that? Like, how, um, like map it out, you mean? Yeah. Um, you map it out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you have to visualize this. We use a lot of um, sticky notes and cards. We use flow charts. Uh, we use a lot of Excel sheets to plan for things. But a lot of it is just keeping it straight in your head. Like you have this story, just sort of this vision that's up there and you know what you need to do for it. And a lot of the job of the creative director, um, the narrative lead and the lead writer is making sure that all of the writing in the game comes together to create those dramatic moments that you need to have, that every line in the game is sort of in service to that greater vision. Um, so it's it's not easy. I mean, the, the interact interactive parts, I think, that are the trickiest are, are that sort of letting go of, of certain moments and understanding that players can skip it if they want. There are players who are just going to skip every single cutscene in the game because yeah. all they want to do is get to the end and find out, you know, that they won. Um, and that's okay. You know, it hurts. It's like a little tiny dagger. Every time you press that skip button, a writer gets attack in their foot. Um, just so you know. <laughs> That's what it feels like, um, that Lego moment where you step on it in the dark. Um, but yeah, I, I, there are people can play however they want. I mean, one of my my favorite videos is when a speedrunner went to visit uh, Double Find and speed ran Psychonauts in front of the team that made it. And you can see them all struggling <laughs> to to understand and to not be upset by how this person has basically reduced their work of art into... Yeah you know, a, a 10 minute experience where they're complaining about, you know, invisible architecture in the air and they're just like quincing and cringing their way through it. But I, it was eliminating. And that's how this person had chosen to experience this game and yep. clearly loved it enough to devote that amount of time to it. And understanding that people will inhabit your world in ways that you never anticipated yep. is, I think, really one of the, the joys and, and terrors of, of working in games. Yeah, like one of the the most frustrating moments like that in in games where you you <laughs> get the next quest like you have to do this to save the world. Yeah, I think I was playing Bioshock with the uh, original one with a friend, mm -hmm. and there are grand reveals and twists in yeah. that story. You get to a, a big twist, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there shocked, and like you have to rush to the next object. Yeah. And he's like, just turns around mm -hmm. and starts looking through trash bags. Like maybe I can find some candy over here. It's like, go 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 go. And that's kind of when I, how do you like how do you actually build drama in cases like that? Um, I guess you can't. Or you you can't you count on the player investment. I mean, one of the the sort of revelations we've had in games in the past few years is that uh, p 
people don't really remember plot that much. Like they remember those big shocking moments, right? But they can't tell you the minutia of, and then this happened, and then there was this reveal. They remember sort of the big picture and that's about it. But they do remember characters. Mm -hmm. So a good way to keep people invested and moving them along the way that you want them to move along in the story is to make them really care about the character they're playing. That's why RPGs are so powerful because you are that character and you have created them and invested in them. Um, and you're seeing the world through their eyes, and you you care. Um, it's harder with a character that's like third person, right? We're trying to make you care about this person that we've created. Think of um, like Ellie, for example, in, in um, The Last of Us. You know, a lot of people didn't want to play as a girl, and a lot of people, you know, wanted to be Joel instead. You know, there were, it's, it's hard to force people into this, this body that maybe they don't want to inhabit. Um, but if you do it well and you make them care about that character, then they have come along on this journey with you. Yeah. And um, they're not going to be reading through that candy because they want to know what's next. Yeah. So. But on, on <clears throat> again, going back to the more practicalities of, <laughs> of the job, yeah. uh, how do the writing and narrative mm -hmm. team work together with the actual game design and development teams? Uh, intimately, <laughs> it would be the word I would say. Uh, the, the two are completely intertwined. You can't have one without the other. Um, communication on, especially projects the size of something like The Division, are so, it's so important. And that usually falls to the writing team because we are good communicators. So we're out there making sure everyone understands the vision for the game, you know, if there's even a sign in the world, we have to make sure that the, the tone of the sign is right. Is this an appropriate message for this point in the game? Is it revealing something? Is this written the way this particular agency would write it? Um, what information is it doing? Is it supposed to direct you somewhere? Is it telling you information about someone's backstory? I mean, there's a lot of narrative information that goes into even these small details um, mm -hmm. in the world. So we have to make sure that everything is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and that involves incredible amounts of, of communication and coordination with these other teams um, who are all enormously talented in their own rights. And sometimes you can just go to them with an idea and say, hey, here's what I'm trying to do in this scene. I'm not really sure what I want. And like just these incredible artists and gameplay people will just come up with these incredible ideas you would never have thought of on your own. And that is the magic of, of making games is that there's this alchemy that takes place when everyone's throwing their ideas together. And it's just... When it all works right, it's wonderful. This is, yeah, because that, that's one mm -hmm. of the things that, that I've been wondering about mm -hmm. this as well, is when you have gameplay mm -hmm. elements, say a piece of equipment or a certain gun, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to do, it has a game design goal, it's supposed to do something very special in a game. Mm -hmm. um, who comes up with the idea first? Like, is it gameplay that comes to narrative and say, hey, we have this mm -hmm. gameplay hook that we want. Mm -hmm. uh, can you come up with a story for it? Or mm -hmm. is it the other way around? Hey, we have this idea for a gadget mm -hmm. that we want your, mm -hmm. your character to have mm -hmm. or functionality that we want in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Because of story reasons. It's both. Yeah, I, I mean, and it should be a two-way street. I mean, both sides should be willing to compromise and help the other team achieve the things that they want to achieve for the game. Because, again, it's a holistic experience. Games are an ecosystem, and everything is interrelated and ties into everything else. And so I can't make a, a major plot change and then not tell the other teams because it could completely ruin something that they're planning. Like, if I decide that, you know... I'm trying to think of a good example. We're not going to go into one particular part of DC because that just doesn't fit my game narrative and I'm just going to cut that part of my story out. But they've planned all this really amazing gameplay for there and there's a special weapon you're supposed to pick up there that relates to, I don't know, it's shaped like an elephant because you found it at the zoo. I don't know. Something like that. And then I just cut that out of my story. That has tremendous impact on players' experience. So I'll have this elephant-shaped gun and not know why. So right. um, It's important. Communication is really key. I actually gave a, a talk earlier this year at a Sweden game conference about uh, the story Bible and how it's a living document and how that should be a reference that people can use to sort of stay on track for the vision of the game and make sure that what they're working on ties into it and everyone's staying in touch about what the needs are. So. Yeah. Game Bibles tend to be these mm -hmm. uh, almost... I'm doing this, holy relics might be taking it too far, but there's always something that players want to see. They want to see the game Bible of their favorite game. Yeah, of course they do. It's got all the good stuff in there. And, you know, quite often, I mean, it's the 
it's the platonic ideal of what the game is in some senses because there are things that didn't actually make it into the game. Um, and they are what, what it all should have been without any sort of constraints of time or, or budget or, you know, whatever else got in, in the way of, of that particular project. Um, so, yeah, so it is sort of seeing an idealized version of what the game should be. But also, if you have a good game Bible, it should be reflecting, you know, where the, the game has progressed to. Um, but should also be looking ahead into the future at what the game might be with some sequels or some DLC or stuff. Um, I'm sure players would love to get their hands <laughs> on a good game Bible. Yeah. yeah. So who, who that writing those are a combination between design and, and narrative? and. Um, it's... I, I have written a number of game Bibles in my career. It usually does fall to a writer because it, it's writing. Um, but it's in collaboration with everyone else. And it is basically pulling the information out of the the creative director's head and then talking to every single team to see what they're contributing to that vision and then just getting it down on the page so that you don't have to constantly follow the creative director around trying to just tease that information out while they're walking along. Yeah. So how, how would, mm -hmm. what would you say a, a person that's interested and started, let's start with writing in general. Okay. Let's, let's just start do there. that. Let's start there. I want to start writing. Okay, start. Wait, Go. Okay. <laughs> that's done. Okay. So you start writing. Okay, so how have you been writing? I've, I've been writing really good stuff. Okay, have you been writing a journal? Have you been writing uh, short stories? What have you been writing? Me? Yes, personally? You, yes, you, this hypothetical. My, okay, the hypothetical person has been writing <laughs> Unless you've the actually... great American novel. Okay. Course, because everybody's writing the great American novel. Are they? Right? Still? Yeah. I, I, maybe. A great novel. <laughs> okay. Uh, on the side. Novel. All right. But a lot of short oh. stories. Uh -huh. I'm posting them on fan fiction forums. Okay. But now I want to turn do, this yes. yeah. into, mm -hmm. turn it into a gaming career. Okay. Um, I think my first question for you would be, why, if you're writing novels, do you want to write games? Because I love video games. And I, I, <laughs> I'm this hypothetical person mm -hmm. is actually working as a bartender. Oh, I and, see. And uh, yeah. she's playing a game. Yeah. She's got really crap dialogue and goes, you know what? My great American novel has mm -hmm. got better dialogue than this. I, I can do this. I, she sounds like an amazing person. This a lot of, lot of yeah. spirit, yeah. Yeah, she, smart too that she, Probably, yeah. she made that connection. Um, I would tell that person who never wanted to write the great American novel <laughs> um, that since she loves video games so much and wants to get into it, she should probably find out how that differs from writing something like a novel or a yeah. short story. So that is appreciating the interactivity of it. And I do see this being a huge problem. Um, as someone who has looked at a lot of writing samples and looked at a lot of writing tests and seen a lot of writing in my 15 years, a lot of writing, um, I can tell you that interactivity is probably the the biggest hurdle um, mm. because there are just some rules you that are just, they go with games and they don't go with screenwriting, for example. Um, we all know show, don't tell, right? But it's also, it's gameplay, not writing. And I think there's a, a desire on the part of the writer to fix everything with words or to over explain or to try to reveal character. And you don't have to do that in games because sometimes players really are that character and you don't want to dictate to them what they're doing or thinking or feeling. They're going to come up with that on their own. You want to guide them through an experience and let that be whatever they want it to be. Um, you have fantastic artists and stuff, so you don't have to worry about describing any of that stuff. And there's a way to deliver the information effectively because you have to educate and direct people around the game and tell them what to do next as well as just you know give them that experience yeah. and i think learning those tricky bits is uh where people mess up the most when they're first getting into game writing that's a lot of tricky bits it's like, a it's a lot it's how an do you art keep it organized yeah. You, you keep coming back yeah, to it. I, yeah, but I, I want to practically want... know what to do because if you... I have all these ideas mm -hmm. for a great game uh -huh. or at least a game mm -hmm. story, like how do I actually get this stuff down on paper? Mm -hmm. Writing samples, for example, for if yeah. I want to prove to a gaming studio, like, okay. hey, I, I understand mm -hmm. the hypothetical person understands interactivity. Yeah. Like, how do I present this? Um, so there are a couple of different ways you can do this. If you're doing it for yourself, there are programs like Scrivener, for example, that allows you, it has like a, a digital cork board where mm -hmm. you can put up little cards and you can sort of track your story on your own. Like, here's my information about my characters. 
But if you're trying to submit samples to a game company um, to get a job, that's a, a different thing entirely. And I once again asked my experts on Twitter <laughs> um, for some advice. And they suggested um, things like um, creating some samples in Twine. I know that Bioware in particular was was asking for some samples in, in Twine at a certain point. Just a short game that they could play in about five minutes that shows them that you understand how interactivity works, that you understand the flow of a game, what a start and a finish look like. Um, you should write a screenplay. Um, we need to know that you are capable of writing one. You will have to write straight up cinematics for, for games in AAA. Um, you'll have to write trailers. You will have to write a lot of highly cinematic moments. So we need to know that you can do that in a format that people can interpret and understand. Yeah. Um, and there are values to each section of a screenplay, and we need to know that you understand what those values are, like what's important in an action section. What do I need to know about this character? You know, how do I relay this emotion in as few words as possible? So we're looking for very specific things. Um, also, barks and ambient chatter and greets and just those little one-off lines are probably the bulk of what you write. As, as a AAA writer, I hate to say it, there's a lot of them, especially a game with combat. Reloading. Reloading. I'm out of ammo. I need some more ammo over here. I mean, you're going to write hundreds and hundreds of those lines. Um, you need to be able to write them really quickly and write them effectively and write them with variations. So we need to see that you can do that. Um, how well do you and how elegantly can you direct someone around a scene is, is a good thing that I look for because that's how you're going to spend a lot of your game too. Directing someone from point A to point B in a way that doesn't feel like you're saying, go kill 10 rats and bring them back here and I'll give you something for them. So um, that's important. So put together a portfolio that has sort of a... a bit of each of these types of writing in it. Um, and then look at the job description and see what kind of games they make. Make sure that you're sort of tonally matching what they want. A game like, a, I mean, let's use a, a good example. We'll go back to The Last of Us. It's pretty gritty, post-apocalyptic sort of feel to that. Um, very cinematic, lots of real characters. You're not going to write a high fantasy script for them with like elves and dwarves and stuff because you're not showing them that you know how to write what they need you to write. So make sure that matches. Write a nice cover letter that tells them why they should hire you. You know, I, I'm, I'm serious. It's amazing to me that people throw that opportunity away yeah. to explain. Your resume tells me what you've done. Your cover letter tells me who you are. Yeah. So, you know, I think people miss that opportunity. Yeah. Yep. Um, and Twine, like we said, and there's... Yeah, I was going to yeah. talk a little bit about Twine, because I've yeah. actually never used it myself. Of course, it's, it's mm -hmm. now class been used to make a whole bunch of, of mm -hmm. relatively famous games uh, yeah. uh, by this point. Yeah. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure I think that's been copyrighted tool. now, that phrase. Yeah. You be careful how you uh, use that. C-Y-O-A. Uh, yeah. E awkward. Um, yeah, no, I'm serious. It's been copyrighted, yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah, but they're going around. Oh, let's not talk about this on camera. Okay. Um, yes, but anyway. Twine. Twine That's is really... great. Um, it's free. Chris Climas uh, accepts donations for keeping it up. Please, you know, throw some money his way. He does a great job keeping it uh, running and running well. But it, it allows you to do very easy and um, simply uh, some interactive writing. So you can just write a quick story, just sort of connect these little boxes that contain information, submit it, and you can play the story in your browser in a few minutes. I mean, it's really fast and easy um, and very simple to use for people who aren't familiar, who don't want to have to, you don't have to script, you don't have to learn really complicated programs. It's very simple and user-friendly. Yeah. Um, I would recommend that just because there's such a low bar to entry. But um, Choice of Games has Choice Script. Um, there's Inkle as well. There are a bunch of um, sort of yeah, Inkle released their whole uh, yeah. engine, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so people can use that. I mean, there's a you can just Google, you know, I want to write a game or a text adventure or something like that, and you'll just get a list now. Um, it's pretty easy to find that stuff. Yeah. Obligatory plug for 80 Days. It's one of my favorite games. Oh, ever. yeah. Oh, so good. It is good. And um, that was Meg, right? Meg Giant and... Could have been, yes. Okay, I thought for sure. I'm pretty sure it it's is. It's Inkle, anyway. Yeah, it is Inkle. It is, it is Inkle. <laughs> it is Inkle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any, any other resources, books, channels? 
Um, so here's the thing. I mean, you can read all the all the books that that you want, and they're they're very good. Some of them. Um, I do have. I started doing reviews of them on my my website, and then I stopped because I I think people get too caught up in trying to to educate themselves. Like there's some golden rule that's going to magically give them the power to write, and the only way to get that is just to keep doing it over and over and over again until you find your voice and you find what works for you. Yeah. Um, and that's only going to happen if you sit down and try. If you try are trying to create this perfect save the cat script because you you read this book, you know I, I've seen like flawless versions of that um, that just don't sing. I mean it's ticking every box it's supposed to, but they haven't hit that emotional resonance that they need, and that only comes from you um, and your power as a writer. I, I've been personally playing around mm. a little bit in Rempy as well. Oh yeah, uh, I haven't used that. How is that? It's uh, if you don't care about things like graphics, music, and sound, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a great tool for mm -hmm. uh, writing visual novels. Okay. I mean, it, Twine is probably better since you don't actually have to care about those things. But it was used for Doki Doki Literature Club, okay. so it's actually quite powerful. But yeah, I'll say. But your audience is only on Doki Doki, by the way. Yeah, great I'll game though. Yeah. Great game. Um, yeah, well, that's interesting. I'll have to check it out. I'll be honest. Um, aside from Twine, I have not used a lot of the the really amazing programs that are out there now because I work in games, um, and I just I have access to proprietary software, <laughs> um, and you know, and tools that the average person doesn't have access to. You know, and I have worked out sort of my own ways over the years. Um, so I've been spoiled, basically, yeah. spoiled rotten. I guess that's where it gets kind of tricky to discuss these things. And like the ministry that I, mm -hmm. I'd like to discuss these things yeah. is because of different companies using different tools that they yeah. can't really talk about. Um, it is true. I I would love to talk about some of the, the really remarkable programs that I, I've worked with at some of these places. Um, because people are always, but how do you get the writing into the game? Like, yeah. how do you get it in there? And it's like that hard it's it's kind of it all fits together um but i can't really say anything about it um i will say that if you're interested in writing screenplays um scrivener and final draft are are both pretty good um final draft is sort of the the standard um i know that's what they they use for just general screenwriting and a lot of the proprietary software that um, i use you can import final draft into it so if you write in that then then you can import it in um but um, and not so much with Scrivener, although you can save that in a final draft format. I used mm -hmm. Scrivener back in mm -hmm. university. I felt very professional using it. Okay, good. So it's just like, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a real mm -hmm. adult now, so learning, you, you, writing, yeah. corkboard. Yeah. <laughs> it feels great. Look at my characters. Yeah, and I used yeah. the, uh -huh. but, but I was a student, so I only used the third day trial because I couldn't uh, afford the actual program. I've been there, yeah. So one essay. Yeah. <laughs> Written as Scrivener, it felt like a great essay. You didn't seize the moment to write your your Her, ultimate fan fiction. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. The great Swedish fan fiction novel. Yeah. I, yeah. Day. What is that? What would that look like? I don't know. I don't want to think about it. Okay. You know what it's time for though? Fika. No lightning round. Oh. I, yeah, Fika actually. <laughs> not like that. Wow. That's how that was a roller coaster. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, Fika, what? Oh, no. I, yes. Yes. Fika. It's time for, it's time for Fika. for cats. Yes. <laughs> they're free. They, to run. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's very, they, they're kind they of free. They're free. on the budget. So yeah. They, they are technically they, free for yeah, us. I bought these. I brought them here. Yes. I went to the store. Yes. And said, "Do you have Lucifer cats?" Yes. And then they kicked me out, and he went and bought them with the budget. That's um, exactly what yes. happened. Yes, yes. every the word true. Story. true. Yes. <laughs> You're obviously a writer. I embellish a that little bit. That's a very believable story. <laughs> Thank you. Believable. You wanna... Okay. Hmm. So I... do you want? So do you want the corner store ones? I want. Or do you want the fancy ones? I want to try the. I think we should each try. Some. Oh yeah, they are. That's to a do good the... thing. They are very like. So here's okay. Yeah, I can scrub that, and then I can yeah. put this into because we have to do the taste test. I mean, to be honest, mm -hmm. we've been preparing in here for quite some time, and these have been on the table because Kervin needs to make sure everything looks good. Mm -hmm. So they've been lying there for a while. So I think they might be a little bit dry. So what are you trying to say? <laughs> I might like, have ruined your feet. I don't know what this disclaimer is. So it might not be as good as you Don't judge think. Sweden by the But the, Why am I holding both? Okay, I'm putting that back. I I'm having the corner store one now. A uh, part of just a piece of it. Okay, so you're eating corner store. I'm eating authentic. Authentic. Don't have the corner store one. 
This is really quite good. Yeah. Yeah, the authentic one. The cornerstone. Really well. <laughs> I didn't understand that, but I'm probably glad mm -hmm. that I don't. Mm -hmm. But now I have to know. I mean, it's good. It's kind of good. Curiosity killed the Lusicata. Was it more Lucifer and less cat, or where? <laughs> it's a really dry Satan. Okay, yeah. Mm. That's you know, like you know what I mean. Flavored chalk, sort of, or maybe yeah. sawdust. Yeah, not good. Not good representation screen. After three hours on the table, also, I'm sure they were good. It also has this weird, like, chemical taste to it. Is that normal? <laughs> or am I having a stroke? <laughs> no, that's we, we. We're poisoning you. Okay, thank God. So, so that's okay. <laughs> I thought it was we, having a stroke. <laughs> these are really good. But these are delicious. These are good. These are actually wonderful. If you are in Malma, stop by. Um, where, where were we? We were at Hollandia. Hollandia, yeah. Um, because these are excellent. These, these are, are really quite good. good. Very seasonal. Yeah. Very, maybe we should say that as well yes. because they are Christmas season. Yes. We are recording this like two weeks, one and a half week before Christmas break. Oh, that's and right. And this is probably not coming out in a couple of months. Yeah, so we'll be like, so these are seasonal. Maybe. <laughs> They'll be like spring. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we can time it to next Christmas. Well, these will really be bad by then. <laughs> hey, Bill. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming in. Uh, thank you for thank you for the, the Lucifer buns and the very bizarre chat. It was wonderful. Yeah. It's been fantastic. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining our Fika today. We've left a whole bunch of useful links in the description, so make sure to check those out if you want to learn more. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and all that fun stuff you do on the internet. Until next time, take care.